We are so glad you're here. I'm Dan Sutherland, one of the pastors today. My opportunity to start this time of teaching. We're doing something a bit different today. We figured we'd pretty much have core folks on New Year's Day and wanted to talk about where we're going for the year. I love new starts. I really do. I love Mondays. I know that's backwards for most people, but wow, another chance and another week to do better than the week I messed up last week. That's a good thing for me. I love the first days of a month. Again, just a new chance to turn a calendar page and say, what's God going to do in January? What's May going to look like? What's coming next? And I especially love the start of a new year. The chance to pause and say, what did God do last year? How did I respond? What's he wanting to do this year? What's going to be different? We do a process here at Westside where the pastoral team gets together in the fall of every year, looks at what has happened in the past year, makes some big rock plans for the next year, and just tries to get caught up with God, just, just hear from him about what he has planned next for his church. And in light of that, we've been praying the last few months about 2012. And we're excited that it starts on a Sunday this year and a chance to kick off a new piece of our journey with Jesus. As I was preparing for this teaching earlier this week, I found myself in Luke chapter 4. And uh, I, I try to keep my own personal spiritual uh, studies and journey separate from what I do on teaching just because if I'm not careful, one of the traps pastors can fall in is the only time they pick up this book is when they're trying to study it to teach. And that's not good. We all need more of it than that. But I was in Luke 4 and this passage spoke to me and I wanted to share it with you today. It's a quote from Isaiah. Jesus is wanting, as he starts out his ministry, to make sure he's following the direction of his Father, and he's also wanting to make sure that he's listening to the leading of the Spirit of God. And this is what he says. Listen for three proclamations. Three times the word proclaim is used in this passage. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the captives free. He has sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Three proclaims in there. I want you to grab your message notes. Would you find them? They're in your bulletin today. Wave them at me. You're going, yeah, Dan, they're there, but they're blank. Yes, they are. On purpose. I want you to write some things down today. It's not going to be on the screen. It's uh, not already filled in in your notes. Three simple things. These are directions for 2012. But before we do that, find your bulletin. Do you have it? Look at the front cover. Check that thing out. Red letter revolution. What is that? That is our theme for all of 2012. Now, you guys are bright. You can think ahead of me for a minute. Uh, just, just jot down something in the blank spot of the notes that you think Red Letter Revolution might be about. Just take a shot at it. Come on, just, just write something in. This is free guest time, no correct blanks to fill in, nothing on the screen. Just Red Letter Revolution. What in the world would that be about? Why is that a theme for the coming year? I'll go ahead and start answering some of that as you're filling it in. For those of you with King James Bible background, you know that in many of the King James editions, the red letters are the words Jesus spoke. In order to make his specific teaching stand out, anything he said, they printed them in the King James for many years and still do in red ink. Those were the red letter words. That's a part of where we're headed this year. Revolution, I hope it is. I hope that it is. And notice the word love flipped around backwards in the revolution word. What is that about? Well, we're going to try to see three things happen this year at Westside. We're going to proclaim three things. Here's the first thing to put in your notes. Number one, proclaim the good news. Number one, proclaim the good news. We want even more than ever before to stay centered on Jesus. 
That is why we're going to be studying the red letter words. That's why we're going to start in the Gospel of John and just take our time going through it. In fact, if you want to read ahead, we will be in John chapter 1 the next nine weeks. It will take us that long to get out of John 1. When you read it this week, you'll know why. There's that much in John chapter 1. We want to stay on three thoughts, really, in this area of proclaiming the good news, studying the red-letter words. Who is Jesus? What did he say? And what did he do to set people free? Who is he? What did he say? And literally, what did he do to set people free? We're going to proclaim the good news. The second pro proclamation, and you caught it in the passage, is we want to proclaim freedom in 2012. We want to proclaim freedom. Jesus said, you will proclaim freedom to the prisoners and set the captives free. Everybody look this way. We are all prisoners to something. All of us. For some of us, it's a habit we can't break, or it's an attitude we're trying to fix. For others, it's something that happened in the past, a regret or a bad experience. For others, it's just we're too caught up on ourselves. We need to get over us. All of us need freedom. All of us are in prison somewhere. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said, and when you know me, you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. We want this to be a year of freedom, a year of recovery, a year of, wow, God, you're healing me. You're taking away the scars of the past. You're making a new person in me. We want to proclaim freedom, and that's around that love word. Literally, as we study through the Gospel of John, we're going to ask, wow, can you believe Jesus loves me that much? And even better than that, isn't it cool I get to love him back? Everybody look this way one more time. When we first come to Christ, it's mostly about what are we going to get out of it. Let's be honest. You come to Christ to get salvation. You come to Christ to gain heaven. You come to Christ to find peace. You come to Christ to find healing. You come to Christ to find purpose. We come with our hands out saying, wow, Lord, what can you do for me? That's okay. We start in Christ most of the time out of what we will get. At some point, we move along to whether we, or, or to the area of doing what we should do. And now it's not just what can I get, it's what should I do. And all of us go through this. It's a period of what are the rules, I ought to keep them. What are the standards, I ought to go for them. So we move from what can I get to what should I do, but here's the third phase, and it's hope, I hope it's where we go this year all through the year. We want to move to what can I do out of love? Not just, hey, I do this because I get good stuff. Not just, hey, I do this because God says I need to, but hey, I do this because I love him. Think about your marriage for a minute. I've been married 36 years. I got married because I found a girl I talked into it and did not think I could come close to doing better. I'll be honest. I mean, I caught her in a bad moment, and she said yes. <laughs> you know? And I'm going, woo, look what I get. Look what I get. I married over my head. She's sweet. She's smart. She's cute. She loves me. Wow. Look at what I'm getting in this deal. And it was pretty awesome. As we were married, I realized there are some things I should do in a marriage. There are rules you keep. You got to be faithful. You got to serve one another. You got to honor one another. You got to guard your tongue. Wow, is that harder at home than anywhere else or what? It's just tougher at home. I've never met somebody who says, oh, he is just perfect at home. But when he gets out at work, he's just a beast. It's almost always the other way around. You know, we, we, we start in a marriage by this is what I get, and then we move to this is what I got to do, the gets to the gotas, you know, the gets to the shoulds. But there's a point, I hope, for all of us where it's just plain, you know, I'm going to do the right thing in my marriage because I love her. She's going to do the right thing because she loves me. It's not I got to be faithful because that's the rules. It's I wouldn't want to hurt her. It's not I got to serve her because that's what God says. It's, it's man. It's an honor to serve somebody you love. Same thing in our relationship to Jesus. We move from what we get to what we got to do 
to what we do out of love. I hope we find that red letter revolution, that love word this year in a big way. The third proclamation, first proclaim good news, center around the red letter word. Secondly, proclaim freedom. We find that freedom in the love of Christ. Thirdly, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's what the verse says. Proclaim the year of of the Lord's favor. We don't talk enough about the favor of God. Here's what I believe it is. God wants to bless you. God wants to use you. God wants to honor you. The question is, am I living a life that is blessable, that is usable, and that is honorable? Now, I'm not talking health and wealth here, okay? Every time you talk about the favor of God, the health and wealth folks go, woo, make me rich. Anybody who ever got, follow Jesus and you'll be rich, out of this book has got chapters in it that I don't have. Because that's not in there. Jesus died penniless. Anybody that can say following Jesus will make you rich in money, wow. Wow. I don't know where they got it, but it's not in this book. I'm not talking about God's going to favor you with riches. He may. I'm talking about he's going to favor you with his presence, favor you with his love, favor us with peace. I mean, I hope that this year we're proclaiming the favor of the Lord. And if we really find it, it will be a revolution. It will be a red-letter revolution. If we stay on his words and study him, if we stay in his love and get free, if we stay focused on Jesus being the revolutionary of all time and we proclaim and ask for his favor. I guess this is what I'm saying. I hope this is a year where we go big or we go home. My buddy, Troy McMahon, is starting a series today up at Restore Community Church. Troy is my best pastor buddy in town. We hang out every week. He's calling it, this could be the year. I like that. This could be the year I go hard after God. This could be the year I pray big and he shows up. This could be the year. That's the best year ever for my walk with Jesus. The best year ever for my family. The best year ever in my journey with Christ. This could be the year. Put all that together and you've got a red letter revolution. Centered on the red letters, looking for how God loves us, how we love him back, and the revolution literally of seeing God's favor. Here's what we're going to do at this point. All our locations today, we're going to do a bit of a discussion on this. Right now, up at Speedway, Pastor Brad, Pastor Jimmy, and Pastor Jim Heaton are going to come out and lead their discussion of how they've heard God speak to them through this circumstance. Up at the prison later tonight, they'll get the first part of this teaching. Hey to the guys in blue up on the hill. We love you guys. We pray for you. And then Pastor Brad's going to lead them in sharing what, what this year looks like up at Lansing. And right now, I'm going to invite Dan Chevron and Troy Kennedy and Brian Phipps to join me. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we think this looks like at Lenexa and at all of Westside. So would you give a hand to Larry Curley and Mo? <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, you know, guys, Morning. sometimes I'm, I think maybe everyone doesn't know. We, we work as a pastoral team. Uh, Westside does not have a senior pastor model. We don't have a Sutherland's in charge, Chavron's in charge, Kennedy's in charge deal. We do it as a team. We make our decisions as a team. We pray together. We've been working toward 2012 for several months. We're all pretty excited about this whole red letter revolution. Um, How'd you get here? What's God been saying to you about 2012? Who'll be second? I'll go ahead and go. Um, hi. Uh, you know, I, I, I was having, over the summertime, I, was, I felt like I was really having kind of a dry season. I just was trying to figure out, what, what is God doing in my heart? I, I, I don't, didn't know what was going on. And I went to this conference, and I heard Francis Chan give a talk on the, the importance of what the presence of God means in our lives. And, and he taught, taught out of John chapter 15, where Jesus, you know, he tells us to abide in him. And it was just like God hit me over the head with just this thing. That it's so obvious, yet so easy to miss. 
And that for, for myself, I had slowly slipped into this sense of my, my, my faith was more about what I was doing than who I was knowing. And it was almost in our loving, becoming like, and sharing Jesus, I had separated loving Jesus from becoming like and sharing him. And I, I was just feeling like it was a burden. It was hard. It was, I was tired. And the thing that I was discovering was if, if you separate those things, the relationship with God from all the other stuff, it winds up being a new kind of Pharisee, a new kind of legalism. And so the discovery for me was to learn to abide in him, to go pursue him, Jesus, to love him because he is the reward. And then the becoming like the sharing, all the activity and all the tasks and all the things that we yeah. can do are the overflow of that. comes out of the relationship. That's good. Yeah. Who else? What's God been saying to you guys? How did we get here? You want to go? After you. Well, you know, I, I, it's been a process. It's been a real joy to lead as a team. Yeah. And because there is a, there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. And as we pray and as we debate and learn together, uh, and, and the congregation learns together. We are drawn to the head of the church, and that is Jesus. We're not the head. Jesus is the head, and our job is to follow him. And, and he teaches. He teaches, love the Lord your God with all your heart. He teaches that I want you to know me. And I think that God has gotten a hold of our hearts, and certainly a hold of my heart, yeah. uh, that, that that relationship is where all the other things flow out of. It's got to start with loving him. And, and actually, loving him starts with knowing his love for us and yeah. what he's done. Yeah. We love him because he first loved us. Exactly. Yeah, you discover that, and then it, it changes yeah, you. We want to emphasize you? that. I mean, that's such yeah. a key piece of all of our learning, to we'll rediscover the love of God. I just this whole process has reminded me that how how beneficial it is to be on a team mm. because my experience has been very different than than Troy's. I mean, uh, he's talking about how he's starting to dry up in his soul. My time at Westside, which has only been about a little over two years, has been an invigorating, reinvigorating time for me. It's the back end of a dry spell that I had had. So mm. it's great to hear because if you're feeling that way, there are many others who feel that way. The orbit that I've been in has been a a surge of energy uh, with the, the missional part. And so I wasn't aware of that. For me, uh, this resurge of loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and sharing Jesus was a step of obedience that God asked us to take as a pastoral team. So if you're asking us how did we get here, we said yes to the last thing he asked us. And he's asking us to do this now, and we're saying yes. So I just think is we're just we're just stepping in where he's asked us to go. If you'll give you if you'll if you'll obey in small things, I'll give you bigger things. Hmm. And uh, the, my thought about this whole idea is that it's a little bit uh, uh, crazy to it's crazy to not obey Jesus, but it's in a little way scary to step into where he wants us to go because he's in charge and who knows where he's going to yeah. take us. Yeah. And I don't I don't have that plan. I don't see the plan is that he's the plan. <laughs> That's a good point. That and, and I don't know where that ends up. And I kind of like to have a little measure of control and all these other but things. But you know, so. Brian, I like him better as a plan than our plan. Oh, yeah. Any day of the week. <laughs> I mean, we're still staying on the same mission, but just to go hard after him. Well, I said earlier, we want to be even more focused on Jesus this year. And we were sharing that with our wives. And one of the wives said, uh, aren't we already kind of focused on Jesus? I said, yeah, we really are. But to know him more, to love him more. By the way, if you were here Christmas Eve, what a great time of worship. We had more than 100 folks that committed their lives to Christ through Christmas Eve services. Is that cool? That's a God thing. Um, what is that going to mean, guys? I mean, what do you think when you hear we're going to be even more centered on Jesus? And I know who's going to start first because every time he talks, it's, it's about Jesus. So... Go ahead, Dan, get us going. Well, I mean, I, it's, it's not because we want to be fanatics about Jesus. It is because when we follow Jesus, <clears throat> we are moving into truth yeah. and into life. And Jesus was very clear. I mean, it's funny when he, any interaction he had, if, as you look at in the Gospels, though he required one thing of everyone he connected with. And that one thing was is that they acknowledged that he is Lord. And that he that there wasn't anything in between him and the people, that he is God, that he is who he said he is. And so that's really, I think, what we're, we want to do. We want to yeah. put Jesus in his rightful place. And the funny thing is, in my life and in our lives, when we put him in the right place, 
then life begins to make sense. Life begins to have meaning. Life begins to have order. Life begins to have some peace. And it also becomes bountiful. I'm reminded of the tree that Sean talked about. When we're rooted in Christ, then we're, we're fruitful and joyful. It's good. Uh, more of him means less of me. The world needs less of me and more of him. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I was never raised in a situation where I was scared of hell. I don't know. I was just kind of raised in a background that never really talked about hell much. Uh, my hell was me and the life I was making apart from him. And so he came and set me free from me. So I've netted it out. More of him means less of me and my wife. I think that'd be a great idea. <laughs> I'm with her. I just, good. I just think I love it. it's so easy for us to take our faith and to... And you, unintentionally or intentionally, it can, it can drift to in, into a set of tenets or tasks or things where, that we're supposed to yeah. do. And that is not the life Jesus had for us. He, you know, he, he says, you know, learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke, the mantle of my teaching is easy, and my burden is light. And I don't know, for, for maybe some of you and for me, I was feeling like the mantle of teaching that I had taken on was heavy. And it was tiresome, and it was a drag, and it was not the life that he had for me. I had a, a sense of religiosity, but I did not have what he wanted. It wasn't his yoke. It wasn't his good. purpose for me. And so when we find that in loving him, we get freedom. We get right. release. And, and if you're carrying that your faith is some kind of a burden, yeah. that is not what he meant for you. I think for me, Troy, it's, it's exactly what you're saying. I, I want us to keep always talking about Jesus for one big reason. I don't want anyone to ever think that it's about religion. Right. Because it's not. It's about a relationship with Jesus. I don't want anyone to ever think it's about church. It's not. It's about the kingdom of God. I don't want anyone to ever think it's about doing good. No, it's about knowing the one who does good and letting him do good in us and through us. You know, it's really easy if we're not careful to make church your God or to make the rules your God or, heaven forbid, some of us even make the Bible our God, you know, I'll just know this. No, Jesus is God. Well, Jesus actually said something about that, Dan. He warned. He said, you think that you have eternal life by this book? This book testifies about me. Yeah. This book is about me. And I love the red letter revolution because, you know, someone once, an old preacher once said that Jesus is in every verse of Scripture if you don't see him the first time, you better go back and look again. And I love that because yep. he is in, he is throughout Scripture. He's the goal. He is the goal. He's you know, the biggest at. nightmare, I've shared this before, the biggest nightmare I have is that some folks at Westside would follow a religious system of do's and don'ts and miss Jesus. Yeah. And you know, he we warned could, we against We could that. call them Shabronites. Yeah, that would be great. I think there's a tribe in the Old Testament, brother. They're in there. Yeah, they didn't fare very well, so no. they have to follow Jesus. <laughs> They've been eliminated. <laughs> you don't hear about them a lot that was, anymore. That's one of the lost tribes, wasn't it? The Shavarnites. I, I think, think you know Dan said that the other day, and it really Shavarn. Sorry, yeah. we got two Dan's. Yeah. Um, and it really hit me hard. It's just like he said, this is my nightmare, that, that people yeah. would follow a religion. And here's the thing. It's like it's so easy to do. Easy. Our, our default mode is to try to turn it into something we can earn. When yep. Jesus already earned it for us, and, he's, and he defines everything by, by our relationship with him. Even in John chapter 17, he defines eternity by virtue of our relationship with God. He says, uh, you know, I have given eternal life to those whom you have given me. Jesus prays of the Father. And he says, eternal life is this, that they may know you right. and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's huge. It's huge. Troy, throw one straight at you. Um, I think of worship in three categories. There's my private worship. That's the life I live. There's my personal worship. That's my time with God. You know, my time of, of speaking to him and singing to him. And then there's corporate worship, which is, you know, all of us together on, on Sunday mornings or whenever we meet. Uh, what would you like to see God do in our corporate worship this year at Westside? You're the worship dude. Kick us off. You want to do it, Brian? No. Brian was itching to cut me off last time, so <laughs> I just thought it. Um, I think, number one, that what we do here in this room is the overflow of our private worship lives. Mm -hmm. And that this will really be a direct reflection, uh, reflection of how we relate to God the other six days of the week. Mm -hmm. And so if this is kind of empty and kind of small, you know, then maybe we need to look at the other six days of the week. I, I always heard... 
heard it said, you know, teeny tiny God, you have teeny tiny worship. And you have a great big majestic glorious God, you have great big majestic glorious worship. And our heart's desire this year is to uh, reveal the character of Christ. It's, it's the revelation of who Jesus is in our lives. And our worship is a direct response to the revelation of God in our lives. And so my prayer is, is that we pursue him and we seek him, we get to know him. Our worship in this room and in our homes yep. will spill over in that. Yep. And our reverence love and it. our love and our passion and our awe for him will overwhelm maybe our, our self-consciousness. You know, the only way to do that is to go beyond knowing about Jesus and begin to know him. There's a big difference between knowing about him. I mean, I could know about my wife, but I know her. I know what she's like. I know what mm. she likes, what she doesn't like. You know, there, there's a big difference there. And I think that that's the beginning of worship. And I think that, by the way, that's something you rediscover every year, it every is. week, every day. And I, that's what fresh. I want to rediscover. Got to stay fresh. In Romans 12, this has kind of been a definition that's driven worship for me my, for the last about 10 years. It's offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's your only reasonable act of worship. And so for me, worship has always been whatever I am doing in response to the love of Christ in that way. And what you're talking about here, a bigger God uh, gem, uh, de generates a bigger worship. Mm. God gets bigger as we see him work in us and through us. And so the joy for me is to go hard all week long after mm. him, watching him build the kingdom of God in me and through me. And when I come on the weekend, it's just mm -hmm. celebrating how big he's been that week. Yeah. You know, the trials that we push through, the, the, the wins that we see happening in our lives and other people's Good. lives. You come in and you see the king who's been reigning all week long, reigning in the praises of all the people that have been fighting with and for him. And uh, to me, that's going to make it a whole lot bigger uh, for me as well. I love it. I think my big prayer for worship this year is that we discover some more freedom mm. as individuals. Um, boy, God has been pushing me that way in the last couple of years. We sang a song earlier today that talked about bowing. I have to bow when I sing that song. I mean, my body's got to reflect what my heart is, is saying and and. If we're talking about praising God, my hands generally do this. Now, am I saying everybody needs to raise your hands? No, but you know what I do want? Everybody to have the freedom to do that. I mean, if God says to you during a service, get on your knees and pray for the next 10 minutes, then get on your knees and pray. It's not about Brian sitting next to me. He's going to think I'm a weirdo if I get on my knees and pray. He already thinks I'm a weirdo. It's not going to take much. You know what? And he's not my audience. Did everybody get that? He's not my audience. So my hope is that we'll just be freer to go hard after God in our, in our corporate worship and in our individual lives. You know, Dan, it's a wonderful promise that God, in Scripture it says that God occupies the praises of his that. people he That's a say. wild promise that as we praise, that he's present, that he occupies that space of worship. So I guess yeah. my prayer would be is, man, let's pour out our hearts to him and let's let him be present. Um, one other quick thing we want to do before we invite them to write something in your notes. Hope you didn't put them up. We're going to use them one more time and we're going to pray together for everyone today. So give me 30 seconds on this, guys. What specifically are you asking God to do in and through West Side this year? What's your big prayer? What's your big ask? What are you saying, God, do this in us and through us? My motto since summer has been pray big and obey small. So I don't know what I'm going to do, but here's my prayer. I'm sick of getting sick of watching TV. Here's what I mean. The left saying this about the right and the right saying this about the left. I don't know what to believe anymore about anything. And it hurts, and it's getting more and more discouraging. Somebody needs to stand up and not just say things, but be what they say, that there's a measure of integrity, that there's a measure of truth, and one who is truth raised up so that somebody can find hope again for real uh, life and, uh, and, and, and real ministry. So if Westside can just put a stake in the ground with him, and be a part of what God's doing, not only at Westside, but in other churches around the country in this way, to give this, uh, to give me hope, at least, wow. and maybe others. Cool. Um, in Hebrews, it says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And I think that's because he is the reward. As we seek him and as we pursue him and we're passionate for him, 
he is the reward. It's not the stuff he does for us. It's not the self-help God who makes our lives better. It's not viewing God as some sort of a slot machine and you pull on the lever and you kind of feel like, okay, let's see if he comes through or not. It's because he is God and he knows us and is with us and he is the reward. And my heart's desire is this, as a community that we pursue him and to see that passion drive all the activity and all the relationships inside this building and all around Kansas City. Wow. Love it. Dan? I love it, Troy. You know, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And Jesus promised life abundant. And I guess that's what I would pray. That's my prayer and my blessing would be that we each would know mm -hmm. Jesus in a way that would direct our lives in the way that we would know the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth would set us free into joy and abundance and that we would have life and life abundant in Christ. There, there is no, there's nothing on earth that compares to that. It's good. We sang my prayer earlier. Mm. I've been trying to voice exactly what my specific prayer for Westside is, for God to do something in and through us in 2012. We sang the words to Jesus, you're a revolution. Mm. I want to be revolutionary. I'm asking God to do something in and through me that's so big this year that the year of end of 2012, I'll say, I am different because God is a revolution and I have chosen to join him and be revolutionary. I'd love to see that happen in every home, in every neighborhood. I'd love to see that happen in everybody's life that's part of Westside. Wow, this could be the year. Grab your notes. Everybody find them. There's a lot of blank space left there. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want to ask you to write out either your big prayer for 2012, what are you asking God to do, or your big commitment for 2012. Now, this is not a resolution. Resolutions die before the end of January. Doesn't work. They're pushing up daisies way early. I'm not asking you to do a, a resolution. In just a minute, I'm going to ask these three guys to pray over us as a church. What I'm asking you to write out is, God, I'd like 2012 to be blank, and you fill it in. God, I'm asking you in 2012. God, I commit to you. And just write in your prayer, your thought. It doesn't have to be exact. It doesn't have to be polished. It may change in the next weeks. Write something out. This is between you and God. God, this is what I'm asking you to do. This is what I'm going to do to follow you. Write something out. Just between you and God. I am so pumped that we've had the privilege of beginning 2012 on a Sunday, of beginning it on a day of worship and on a day of rest. And I believe that the core of the church is who will show up all day today. We won't have a ton of guests on January 1. We'll have the diehard spiritual Marines that you guys are. Hoorah. <laughs> Hoorah. Spoken like a Marine. So let's go straight at it, guys all this year. Keep writing that out. I'm going to ask these three men to pray over you, and here's how we're going to pray. I want you to find a position of prayer that works for you, and if that's sitting right where you are, do it. If it's kneeling in the aisle or in the space between you and the row behind you, great, kneel there. If it's coming to the front and standing here or kneeling, I, it doesn't matter. I just want you to find a place where you can be comfortable being prayed over for a couple of minutes. And I'm going to ask Troy and then Brian and then Dan to uh, just say a 30-second prayer over us as a church. Find that position of prayer. Will you do that? Find that place where you're comfortable. So, Jesus, we come before you today as a community of Christ followers in all these different places in our walk with you and asking that this year you reveal yourself to us in ways that we have never known, that your spirit move through our lives as individuals and as a community in the ways that we've never known. We know they're not ways that are new to you, but God, as you have us in this in place together in this time and this season and as our lives intertwine with each other, you redeem all that humanity and all that frailty for something profound and something beautiful and something redeeming here in our community. 
Jesus, we want to know you. And in knowing you, you pour out of our lives everything, every dream that you have for our church and for Kansas City. God, you have created us anew in Christ Jesus to do the good works that you created us to do long ago. Radically draw us closer to you in love. And then out of the abundance of that love and adoration of you, change us from the inside out. Make us into that new being that you've already declared us to be. And may that new being be what shares you with the world around us. And may you be lifted up through us, through everyone here, so that all people are drawn to you. Lord God, we just thank you for this time. And we thank you, Jesus, for how long and high and wide and deep is the love of Jesus Christ. We're amazed, Lord God. We ask you to, through your spirit, pour anew, afresh, your spirit in our lives, Lord God. We acknowledge right now, Lord, that we can do nothing apart from you, Jesus. You taught us that. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We declare your power and your majesty and your lordship over our lives. All of you who declare Jesus' lordship over your lives, say yes. Yes. All that declare lordship of Jesus in your lives, say yes. 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 Lord, we agree with you. We thank you, Jesus. We submit our lives, Lord, to you now afresh. Thank you. Amen. Bless you, West Side. This is going to be the year.